there you go. Here are my disclosures. Uh, I'm not gonna say anything about the robot. So how, how prevalent are inguinal hernias? We really don't have any precise data. A lot of these go unreported in terms of uh, being asymptomatic. We do know that in the US at least, there are somewhere between 500 and 70, uh, 750,000 repairs a year. The global incidence may be as high as 18.9 million. That comes out to about a 10% risk for each individual. And the male to female ratio is heavily uh, weighted towards the males 19 to one. As far as the different type of groin hernias, indirect by far the most common, both males and females, followed by direct, but you can see there's a big drop in the females. Again, females are uh, more common with femoral hernias. This goes back way to Gray's anatomy. You can see here the external and in internal iliac veins. This is looking from the inside, the rectus muscle, the psoas muscle here. And where the spermatic structures go in, this is where we're gonna have our indirect defect, and this is box triangle where we're gonna have our direct defect. And both of these are probably, this is from a patent process is vaginalis, but probably also from some atretic uh, aponeuroses from the transverse, transversus abdominis, just like over here. Hernias uh, have been recognized for a long time. In ancient Egypt, this is Ramses V, 1145 BC. So 3,000 years ago, he, when they dug him up and unraveled him, they found that he had a very large scrotal sac and it was plicated up against his per perineum. So somebody, his personal surgeon or something, tried to repair his inguinal hernia. And it's kind of funny that 3,000 years later, we still don't know what's the right way to do this. Uh, they'd probably be surprised, thought we would figure it out by now. But in the 1800s, Bassini was the first to sort of describe consistently a way to repair inguinal hernias, and it was a sutured repair, um, kind of combining the conjoint tendon with the shelving edge of the inguinal ligament, closing that floor there. I love this picture because it's a side view. Uh, you can see the external oblique muscle here is reapproximated. That's not part of the strength of the repair. And the transversus abdominis, the transversalis fascia right here, um, the internal oblique, no, internal oblique transver transversus abdominis, the fascia to the shelving edge of the inguinal ligament kind of closing the space right here. This probably works in a few cases. Uh, the shoulder ice repair, I just spent some time on the Shodoy Clinic uh, website last night. I haven't been red pilled that hard since I went on the Flat Earth Society website, but it's pretty amazing stuff. They have uh, great, great results. Now you have to be skinny to do that. So for most Americans, it's like, well, I'm out. You know, you have to have like a normal BMI. <laughs> but kind of starting off, sort of like the Bassini repair, and then they start um, putting more <laughs> layers together, uh, ten or twenty more layers together, and, and get a real solid repair like that. And then McVeigh also was a tissue repair kind of distinguished by closing down the um, femoral space. So this fixes the femoral hernia too. So you start off with the conjoint tendon and the Cooper's ligament, which is a lot deeper down here, making a transition stitch ultimately up to the shelving edge of Poupard's ligament. You can see a little relaxing incision here, which is a modification of that. But it was really the Lichtenstein repair, which has brought us to the modern day open repair, which is the tension free um, mesh repair. You can see that medially it'll be sutured either in running or uh, interrupted fashion to the conjoint tendon, the shelving edge of the inguinal ligament. And this has worked well for, for a lot of us for a long time, but we'll see, maybe there's a better way. There are other ways that hernias have been described, Kugel, Stopa, Trabuco wants, went. Halstead, uh, the darning technique, the Sarda. I'm not gonna go into details of these. I wanna get to the meat of this, uh, which are presenters with their types of perfect repair. What kind of outcomes are we talking about? It's all over the place. As low as 0.5%, as high as 15% or more. Chronic pain, 0.7%, as high as 75%. Uh, generally speaking, the laparoscopic approaches have shown to have less chronic pain. Mesh, um, is not necessarily associated with more chronic pain. So we'll see what our presenters think about their repairs and how it, whether or not theirs is good enough and uh, what it does for these outcomes. And then as far as laparoscopic and robotic, um, you know, we're gonna rehash the whole TEP-TAP debate. Uh, as robotic repairs uh, have come up, the TAP has been popular, but you can do them as TEP. 
And then there's a variation of the laparoscopic TEP repair called enhanced view TEP, where you kind of move back a little bit, get a little space to work with. As we go through this debate and get our wonderful speakers up, I want us to think about these hernia repair outcomes. What's important in hernia repair? We certainly want to reduce symptoms. We want to improve the patient's quality of life over time. We want to prevent serious adverse effects. It's not just incarceration strangulation when you're not repairing them, uh, but um, you know, 70% of patients who you do ACE, uh, watchful waiting on who are asymptomatic eventually convert just because they develop new symptoms. And to minimize complications, whether it's bowel complications, infections, aroma, chronic pain, uh, recurrences. And so keep these in mind as we go through open versus lap versus robotic. That's all I have. Let's have our sp first speaker up. <laughs> 